And today we are so excited uh, to host our third webinar in this series uh, entitled Bringing a Justice Orientation to K-12 STEM Teaching and Learning featuring Dr. Edna Tan and Dr. Angela Calabrese Barrett. And so in this webinar, they will share a justice oriented framework that highlights how STEM educators can make connections to the realities and issues that guide students' lives uh, and they'll be sharing case studies drawn from both formal and informal STEM teaching and learning environment. And so I'm going to start off with a brief uh, overview of their bios. Um, so Dr. Edna Tan is a professor of science education at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Her collaborative research investigates what constitutes equitable and consequential science and engineering learning for historically underrepresented minoritized youth across learning contexts and over time. This collaborative work has been and continues to be undertaken in middle school classrooms and youth-based community centers in both North Carolina and Michigan. And her research has been published in the American Education Research Journal, Teachers College Record, the Journal of Learning Sciences, Journal of Research in Science Education, Science Education, among others. Um, and Dr. Al Angela Calabrese Barton is a professor in the Educational Studies Department at the University of Michigan. Her research is grounded in the intersections of teaching and learning science with an emphasis on equity and social justice. Calabrese Barton has served as a WT Grant Distinguished Fellow and as a fellow of the American Education Research Association. She's the former co-editor of the Journal of Research and Science Teaching and is currently co-editor of the American Educational Research Journal. And her research has been recognized by the American Educational Research Association with the American Education Research Association Award for exemplary contributions to practice engaged research in 2018, the 2009 Award for Research Leading to Transformations of Social Context, and the 2004 Exemplary Research Award in Teaching and Teacher Education. And so I am so excited again to introduce and to share this space uh, with uh, both Dr. Tan and Dr. Calabrese Barton. And I, now I will hand it off to them. Uh, to begin their presentation. And again, um, please, um, if you do have questions, feel free to use the Q&A tool uh, to pose your questions, and then we will address those questions after the presentation. Uh, thanks again. And uh, Dr. Tan, Dr. Calabese Barton, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you everyone for being here. We're really excited to be able to share our work. And today we're gonna to focus on um, a framework for justice-oriented teaching and learning in STEM that we call Rightful Presence. And so, as Ralph mentioned, I'm Angela Calabrese Barton, professor at the University of Michigan. And I'm Edna Tan, a professor at UNC Greensboro. Thank you for having us. We're so glad to be here. Oops. All right, so what we wanna do is to start off by sharing um, some youth quotes with you. And we want you to consider these quotes. They're all made by youth of color in the middle grades and high school. And we wanna ask you to think about what the youth are saying about their welcomeness and about their belonging in school and in STEM and why. So let's hear from Sana first. She says, when you walk into some classrooms, you feel like they don't want you there. And Samuel, who's 14, says, teachers care, but they do not care about the community all of the time. We go outside on our time and find places where we can go do science or engineering for our communities. School doesn't know how to do that. School doesn't know that we do that. We need to tell our teachers how we do it. We got to help them. Let's hear from Jasmine. The racist stereotype is that black people are not listening to science, but that is not true. Maybe it's the other way around, like science is not listening to us. I just wish that people could see what I do. Like, what am I doing at home? Making homemade hand sanitizer, making masks, caring for my elders. I don't want to act white. I don't want people to tell me I'm not white enough. I want you to know how I feel as a young black girl in America and in STEM. I want to feel like I can be me in STEM and have that celebrated. And Quentin, a young black boy in fifth grade wrote this letter to his teacher. Hi, Mr. B, this is your student Quentin, the first one in the second row. I'm going to tell you about things that we should do in science. I do things out of school and out of my after school STEM club that involve science. I went door to door and asked adults if they used CFL lights. The majority of the adults did not use CFL lights. I tried to decrease the amount of people who use incandescent lights. I did it on Wainwright Avenue, and I did it because people's bills are up because they use just incandescent lights. 
but it's not, not so much for energy that I get attention in school, but for being a smart ally. So what are you saying about the welcomeness or belonging in schooling and in STEM and why? Well, youth are saying that they're invisible in school. They're made missing despite their embodied presence. This is Quentin, the first one in the second row. The youth are saying that they are noticed for their deficits and not for their strengths. Their hopes, fears, dreams, and worries are not a part of teaching and learning science, at least explicitly. Their community science expertise is not noticed and perhaps not valued in schools. They have limited opportunities to have ownership over materials and activities. They are not recognized for who they are and what they want to know. Some of the youth feel they have to be white to be acknowledged. And they feel that they have to fight stereotypes on their own. So what we want to do right now is focus on why equity as inclusion is not far enough. What are the limits of equity as inclusion? So if we think back to what the youth just said, some of what they said could be addressed by this focus on equity of inclusion, that is by providing high quality learning opportunities for all students. These comments also push though on the boundaries of inclusion. And as we just noted in our reflections, some of the considerations youth point to relate to whether or not they're legitimately welcomed into schooling and into science. And so we wanna share our thinking about why we need to move beyond inclusion as our goal to why rightful presence should be our goal in STEM teaching and learning. So we want to um, back up just for a second to unpack just a little bit more the limits of inclusion. I think we can all agree that students deserve high quality opportunities for STEM learning, where those opportunities um, focus on engaging in challenging ideas, discipline specific activities, um, where youth are valued as members of the learning community. I mean, these are basic rights that all students deserve. Indeed, access to quality STEM education should be a civil right, as Bill Tate wrote about. However, how these rights are extended and enacted can make a difference in whether or not a student is welcomed as a fully legitimate member of a learning community. And so we need to ask ourselves whose values, whose beliefs, and whose ideals undergird these rights? Who does one need to be to fully receive these rights? Extending rights only provides resources and approaches for making participation in the current constructions of classrooms and the disciplines possible. So when we think about the current constructions of classrooms and disciplines possible, we think about rights to a high quality learning as grounded in the dominant discourse and practice of schooling and of STEM that reflect white and Western ways of knowing and doing. The way that STEM is often taught in schools and how students are expected to learn further projects and reproduces these dominant cultural norms. One way to think about this is in how equity as inclusion is built on what, um, what the scholars have called and we have leveraged on a guest host relationship model. And the way schools are run depends on the continuance of a guest host relationship model. Students are the guests in their classrooms. They are expected to follow dominant routines and practices, and they face the threat of disciplinary or academic sanctions for non-compliance. Youth who are historically marginalized in the disciplines and in schooling because of their race, immigration status, language, class, sexuality, gender, even when positioned as a welcome guest, which is not always the case, are expected to reconfigure themselves towards the majority culture. We know that engaging in STEM is deeply grounded in people's experiences in the world, including those of their families and their communities' cultural practices. We also know that students from historically non-dominant communities have powerful cultural knowledge and experience that are highly relevant to engaging with STEM. But for many of these students, engaging in STEM in school settings are constrained and limited. Consequently, not all students are encouraged, nor are they supported in leveraging their powerful cultural expertise toward meaningful learning or engagement in STEM. So we can think about this as denying 
denying students a rightful presence in science learning. So the challenge with making sense of the limits of inclusion, the challenge of making sense of how students might be denied that rightful presence is that um, these limits are really hard to see for many people. And that's because of a number of things, you know, it's because the goals of inclusion are important and they remain important though we suggest they're insufficient. It's because many of us are so enculturated into the normative routines and practices of schooling, of STEM and society as it currently exists. It's because um, some of us um, are more um, rightfully welcomed in different communities because of our race, our gender, our sexuality, our language. And that can make it really difficult for us to see the experiences of others that might be different from us. So we want to unpack for you this notion of rightful presence a little bit more um, and then offer some examples that give it some texture um, in the context of classroom life. And so this idea of rightful presence grows out of critical justice studies of the guest host relationship in sanctuary cities that Edna mentioned. And, um, and in these studies, they um, seek to trouble the assumptions of what it means to be inclusive in the present and not in some abstract future. And so this calls attention to the political struggle that people engage in to reauthor rights and how they're enacted in practice in ways that disrupt um, injustices and unequal power relationships, rather than thinking about just simply um, extending rights, um, which may in effect reproduce unequal power relations. So if we bring this to back to classrooms, we can think about how students are guests in classrooms. And so what does it mean to have rights extended to you as a student in a classroom? What would it mean to support youth in engaging in political struggle to reauthor those rights in a classroom setting? So as kind of a, a backbone um, way to begin to think about rightful presence, um, we suggest thinking about it this way for now, that we can think about rightful presence in education as legitimate membership in a classroom community because of who one is and not because of who one, you know, quote unquote, should be, where the practices of that community work towards and support restructuring power dynamics towards more just ends through making both scales of injustice and social change visible. So we can think about rightful presence as this critical mode for making present the lives, the experiences, the histories, the hope for futures of those who've been made missing by the various forms of racialization and colonization and so on that manifest themselves in normative schooling practices. So how do we make present what has been made missing? How do we know to see, see and look for something which has historically been erased? Uh, let's look at Amir's experiences that we've titled Unless You Are Black. One of the best ways to describe what we mean is to talk about Amir, a 12-year-old black boy and his white teacher, Mr. A, whom we worked with. So we tell this vignette not to bash Mr. A at all. He is a wonderful teacher and his students love him. And Mr. A has spent time in our research practice partnership, working with his colleagues and with us on justice-centered teaching, what that means in teaching science. Uh, Mr. A admirably supports his students in thoughtful disciplinary activities and his facilitation positions students to be active contributing members. So Mr. A is completely committed to all his students having access to rigorous science learning. This is why it's sometimes hard for us to see the limits of equity as inclusion. So here is the scenario. During the final crime scene investigation of a forensics unit, Mr. A was explaining the importance of gathering and analyzing data to accurately find and convict the right criminal. He emphasized being fair and using data as evidence. But Amir interrupted, calling out, unless you're Black, if you're Black, you'll be convicted. Mr. A seemed caught off guard by Amir's comment, and he responded in a very caring voice. I like the passion in that statement, but let's make sure we talk about that somewhere else other than this classroom at this moment. If you want to talk about that later, we absolutely can. Amir did not verbally respond after Mr. A said that, but he lightly nodded his head and looked frustrated. 
Working with his friends, Amir completed his work as expected with animation and rigor. He stated that he liked most of his friends' science class, but he did not talk to Mr. A about this topic later. And then when Mr. A was, he said that he knew in the moment when Amir shouted out, unless you're black, that that was a very important moment. He told us that this moment hits him really quickly because it's a very powerful thing to say. He also noted that talking about racism and forensics was challenging, especially to do it in front of a whole group of students when all of them come from different backgrounds. Mr. A remembered that he gave Amir a smile because I didn't want him to think that what he said was wrong. Mr. A further explained that he thought Amir understood from the exchange that science class was, quote, not a place to bring up politics. Mr. A, the institutional representative of the rights to high quality disciplinary learning, welcomed Amir as he extended these rights to high quality disciplinary learning, but he was unwilling in the moment to engage with Amir to reauthor such rights in his learning community, even when Amir's comment put these rights in tension with the political struggle of being black in the white dominated spaces of the criminal injustice system and in STEM. Amir's experiences of injustice in STEM and society where the criminal injustice system systemically inflicts injustices upon black bodies were amplified by having his concerns sidelined as not the focus of STEM class. While Amir did actively participate and demonstrated the learning of key ideas through his accomplishments, the possibilities for disrupting the local production of systemic inequities were suppressed. The extension of rights to participate in this case still invalidated legitimized discussions of how the norms governing forensic science are racialized. So who youth are and would want to be would look different in classrooms if students were more than guests, if students had a rightful presence in their classrooms. The youth that we've worked with have stated, for example, that an important form of expertise that should be valued in schools is that of a, what they call community science expert. And as um, defined by one of these young ladies, um, a community science expert is doing things that are good for the community because of what we know. We know a lot of science and we also know a lot about our community. Who else can put these ideas together? And so here the youth's community knowledge is not a resource towards fitting into the power dynamics already at play, but rather it's about upending what really counts in STEM teaching and learning. Equity and inclusion isn't just incorporating people or their expertise into things that already exist. It's about changing that which already exists. So what we want to do is to um, lay out for you right now three tenets of a rightful presence framework. We want to unpack those tenets a bit, and then we're going to jump into um, some de detailed vignettes to um, further contextualize them for you. And so the first tenant of the rightful presence framework is allied political struggle is integral to disciplinary learning. It's about the right to reauthor rights. And so when we say that allied political struggle is integral to disciplinary learning, we mean that teachers and students work together to challenge and to transform what participation in the disciplines entails and what meaningful representation of learning looks like in ways that humanize participation and in ways that value youth as whole people with complex and full lives. We call this reauthoring rights because these disruptions and transformations change whose knowledge, practices, and experiences matter. We can't rely though on just asking students how they want to reauthor rights is they don't always know. We have to, as educators, we have to be attuned to what youth bring to the classroom. We have to be attuned, attuned to the bids that they make to be rightfully present. And we have to design for ways that allow for these bids to emerge. The second tenant is rightfulness is claimed through presence, making both justice and injustice visible. And so when we say that rightfulness is claimed through presence, what we mean is that youth's whole lives and that which makes participation in STEM 
empowering or marginalizing or everything in between a visible part of learning. It becomes the stuff upon which uh, meaningful learning is built. So go back to the last example that Edna shared with us. Amir's identity as a black boy and his community experiences with policing is a part of his engagement with forensics, whether it's taught that way or not. We can think about this as also making the work of justice happen here and now in the moment, as in this moment and in this classroom with this group of youth rather than making it, you know, some abstracted future thing. You know, so for example, if you learn what I'm telling you now, you could be a scientist one day. And orientations towards the future is important, but so is the present. And then the third tenant is collective disruption of guest host classroom relationalities, amplifying the socio-political. So lastly, when we say collective disruption of guest host classroom relationalities, what we mean is that the responsibility for disruption and for transformation is borne by all members of the learning community, teachers and students alike, not just borne by those who've been marginalized as the process is constructed now. This kind of power sharing is important because it helps to create new and different spaces for making youth's lives visible um, as we noted in tenant two. So, Enacting these three tenants together might sound daunting. It is daunting, but I think we can find some hope in looking at how our partner teachers have worked towards rightful presence with their students in classrooms by being co-learners with their students and by actively planning and designing for those opportunities. So what we want to do right now is look at another example, again, from forensics, um, where um, a teacher's actions in the moment um, supported youth's more rightful presence. So this was during a lesson on fingerprinting and two girls, Monica and Cassie, were lifting each other's fingerprints um, onto their FBI fingerprint cards, which was part of the activity they were doing that day. And then um, after completing that task, Monica got up and tapped the desk loudly three times like this stating for all to hear, I am the judge, you are guilty. Cassie, you are guilty. We saw your fingerprints at the crime scene. Cassie, um, who, uh, who's a black girl, looked surprised and confused and stated, no, that room in the crime scene is my room. I have a lot of fingerprints in there. Ignoring Cassie, Monica started telling a story in which Cassie might've committed the crime. Another um, youth, Chloe, who's also black and a friend of both girls, looked over at Cassie, who was becoming visibly increasingly upset by Monica's activity. And she, she walked over to Monica um, and asked her to offer reasons for Cassie's guilt based on actual evidence. After listening, Chloe further exclaimed, nope, that is not evidence. That is just what you say. We need evidence before then, she's not guilty. So, what happened at this moment exactly? Well, other youth started jumping into this impromptu role play. For example, one youth joined in to support Cassie as Cassie's neighbor who could attest to her alibi. Another jumped in explaining they were a juror and they wished to see the full slate of evidence. Pretty soon the whole class was watching. So Miss B recognized the significance of this impromptu role play and use that moment to put a pause on the fingerprinting activity to engage the youth in critical dialogue on what it meant to make careful evidence-based decisions and why this was important in determining someone's guilt or innocence. She asked students to consider why this conversation was important in terms of racial equity. She listened to the students she wrote their ideas down on the whiteboard. She wrote their questions down, their concerns, their opinions, all without judgment. And after that, she then helped the students organize, self-organize into a whole class courtroom scene where all the youth were involved as either witnesses or members of the jury and other roles. And as the youth began to plan this role play, 
Cassie, who was agitated before, became more visibly and audibly engaged in the activity and more physically animated, jumping up, strengthening her physical stance, becoming much more vocal. And so here we see um, Miss B, the teacher, centering the girls' fears, the concerns that they have, um, by recognizing the tension that was at the heart of the girls' role play. And in pausing that moment to talk in more detail about what it meant to use scientific evidence in a trial, including how the process is racialized and political, and then extending that role play to all the youth in that class, um, really um, was the way in which Ms. Spee began to legitimize Cassie and Chloe's efforts to reposition this activity is not simply an exploration of forensics or using evidence to make decisions, but an exploration of that intersection between socioscientific justice and forensics. So the case Angie just shared reflects one way that we have been working with our partner teachers. Uh, Ms. B, like Mr. A, also has been working with us for some time to engage in critical reflection on practice. One of our efforts had focused um, on helping teachers become more attuned to youth lives. What exactly does that mean and what should one do? Both the assets that youth bring and the injustices that they uh, embody and, and engage and feel every day. Some of the reflection questions we had used together include, how are students welcomed as legitimate, contributing and fully human member of a learning community because of who they are and not who you want them to be or who schooling thinks they should be? What forms of student knowledge and practices are valued in your classroom as a part of science learning, as a part of science practice? When are these forms of knowledge and practice most valued? When are students' cultural knowledge and practices less visible, less human, or less welcomed in your classroom? How and why? Sorry. <laughs> So um, another way, so Edna just described a, a set of um, reflective questions to guide um, reflection and planning and enacting. Um, what we're going to share with you now is a pedagogical approach that we've also co-developed with teachers as a way to support um, working towards more rightful presence in um, STEM in classrooms. And it's something that we call pedagogies of community ethnography. So pedagogies of community ethnography are those that support teachers not just in noticing students live lives, but in doing so differently, like shifting not only what they see and notice about students, but also where they see it, but also to see what they've seen before in new and different ways. And so pedagogies of community ethnography involve a stance that community knowledge and practice is a valuable part of disciplinary knowing and doing, STEM knowing and doing. Also involves new roles um, for students and teachers as co-learners of the intersections of community wisdom with STEM. And also involves instructional moves that create spaces for eliciting and making visible community wisdom. And that which also refract these forms of knowing and being into disciplinary learning, disrupting settled expectations for who and what it means to learn in STEM. So pedagogies of community ethnography explicitly tie to the principles undergirding rightful presence in the following ways. First, uh, pedagogies of community ethnography support youth and educators in dialoguing around critical questions which should guide our work mentioned earlier, such as who takes part in defining problems? generating data, and authoring new knowledge and solutions. These questions apply across many discipline areas, including mathematics and social studies, uh, in addition to STEM. Second, pedagogies of community ethnography open up critical engagement by making injustices visible and the connections between learning and doing STEM and the community wisdom that youth possess. In this next example from our GRK12 project, we want to share with you what this can look like during an Engineering for Sustainable Communities unit, where teachers integrated pedagogies of community ethnography across the engineering design cycle. Uh, we will be zooming into the second engineering design challenge in a unit, and that design challenge is focused on how can I make my classroom more sustainable. As a part of this unit, students created a working prototype 
that promoted classroom sustainability. And they had to use copper tape, LED lights, a renewable energy source, and anything else they could find in their classroom or school or through recycling. And they had to include a complete circuit. Throughout this design challenge, students had multiple opportunities to engage with community ethnography as a part of the engineering design. So um, across the five years of this project um, with our partner teachers in two different cities, um, we've implemented these design, well, we co-developed these um, design challenges with teachers and implemented them um, in with really thousands of students. And so we've documented um, the variety of ways that community ethnography as pedagogy supports the youth and not in the political struggle for a rightful presence in STEM. Um, and we've written some different papers on this that we can share with you at the end. But what we wanna do right now um, for the sake of time and also because we really kinda of wanna get into the, the texture of this is to zoom in closely into one example from Ms. J's classroom to be able to illustrate how this plays out over time in a classroom. And so you can see Ms. J in the middle there. She's a veteran teacher. Um, she's a beloved teacher. She teaches sixth grade at a school that's home to on the local refugee center, as well as multi-generational white and African-American communities. Um, and it has a recently um, growing Latinx community. So what we wanna do for this example is to zoom into um, the work that a group of three youth did on their project that they called the Occupied. And so the girl, the group involves Meg, who's a white girl, Mateo, who's Latino and indigenous boy, and Trin, who's a black boy. And over the course of the six weeks that this teacher, Ms. J, um, implemented the unit, um, they identified the problem of bathroom bargains as something that worked against their classroom sustainability. And it was something that they wanted to try to design for um, with, this, with this design challenge. There's something that's kind of important here that I wanna point out. And that is in this particular school, in this sixth grade hallway, the, there's not bathrooms down the hall. The individual, there's an individual bathroom located in each classroom. And per you know, school rules, the bathroom door does not lock. And so what the youth wanted to do was to create a system that better helped to um, let people know when somebody was in the bathroom and prevent those moments where somebody intentionally barged in. And so if you look across these three pictures, you can see that the Occupy um, has a solar, in the picture to the far right, you can see a solar panel. So when you flick on the bathroom light, it activates the solar panel, which then, you know, electricity goes through those copper tapes, goes through the door and lights up those three LED lights that are affixed to the wall on the outside of the bathroom. So um, when somebody goes in the bathroom, shuts the door and turns the light on, those lights light up. And of this project, Meg, Meg said, sometimes kids make a mistake. We wanna stop the kids who do this on purpose and then spread rumors about the students being barged in upon. Mateo explained, Thomas got walked in on twice. Now he never goes to the bathroom during the day. And in the, then in the sixth grade hallways, they make up rumors. It's ridiculous. And so in this case, um, targeted bathroom bullying through intentional barge -ins was a political struggle that the youth wanted to take up as a part of what mattered in their engagement in STEM in their sixth grade classroom. So before we delve into this, we actually want the youth to share um, their project with you on their themselves. They made this video. Do a demonstration. Yeah, when I do a demo. I'll, I'll be in here. I'll be in here using the bathroom. Okay. Supposedly, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to not let somebody would answer, or you would slowly open up the door. He just he just like opened the door carelessly. Yeah, I would. It is a problem is because 
Embarrassment. Embarrassment, that's another one, and like people will start trends around the school, like in this, like, like in the six feet hallway. They'll like, either make up rumors, it's either that or they make up rumors. It's it's ridiculous, and so we wanted to try to stop or and, and other prevent, pre prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. So we just thought like that's a really big problem because. was using it and this way light when the lights are on you will know not to come in and then we have this sign for reference okay so now let's show here okay so we have our solar panel right here that's taped to the wall and the light is making the energy come through. Just, just, just to make sure, and I'm just letting you know, this duct tape doesn't, it doesn't rip off any paint. Yeah. again because at first we only started with one light which I guess for some people it wasn't it wasn't too bright and not too standing out we had a, like a darker red but it, was, it wasn't working and then when it was sort of working you really you could see it sort of yeah. see it so I think that like the green paper would stick out more than pretty much any other color So what do you think she sees when she sees before? Guys, this is how well we work together and how like we, like the teamwork and like the, the amount of brains and just ability to do stuff and work. Like every time when we were working on it, we were good, good because when someone was getting frustrated, another person would take over and like try fixing it, and when that person got frustrated, the next person stepped in. And we all sort of helped each other when we didn't understand it or anything in the building process. weeks since the last time someone got walked in so as we saw in the video with teacher support uh, Meg Mateo and Thomas studied the bathroom problem by conducting and then analyzing surveys interviews and observations in their school as a part of STEM class they used these data to design a way to implement a lighting system so that it could effect change and address a problem that they were so aware of, which is the barge in of particularly on boys of color. So we think how students model their ethnographic data is important in making justice and injustice visible. However, however, it is not just that ethnographic data was brought into the classroom. It was in how students used these data as public epistemic resources that made their lives visible in STEM. When students modeled their data through charts and graphs and bubble maps, uh, these forms of representations created space for new STEM community hybrid discourses to emerge as they talked about what these representations meant. Uh, these hybrid discourses integrated STEM knowledge and the knowledge of the needs of communities. So we want to um, just look at a few different moments in the analytic process that the youth engaged in as they studied community insights gleaned through the community ethnography on sustainable communities. And so um, in the survey analysis, and we have some snapshots of their work here, um, you can see that Trin noted that their group needed 
um, quote, needs more chance to do something important because 45% of the kids thought that was most important. Meg said, you know, she noticed in the interview data that a large percentage of the group wanted to quote, raise class morale and to show what they could accomplish. And then in looking through the interviews that they did side by side with the surveys, Trin reported that one person said that people were worried about people barging into our classroom. And as they focused on that comment, they began to talk about how barging in was a problem and all the different ways in which barging in happened. So then they began to conduct different kinds of observations and they began to map those on observations onto the survey data. Mateo pointed out that kids barged in a lot in the classroom and in the bathroom. As he stated, the survey got us thinking about how the bathroom, it's a real problem. The group then conducted further observations and interviews to learn more specifically about how the bathroom problem played out across different school spaces. So the Occupied project also ended up requiring greater technical expertise than those required by the standards, leading um, Ms. B to worry, the teacher, to worry whether this group of students, can they get this done, and of her own ability to help. And she said, I just wasn't sure that I could help them. For example, when the students in the occupied role played getting barged in on with their initial design that involved only one LED light, uh, students on the other side of the, of, the, of the room who were not involved in the role play called out to them to say that that one white light was not bright enough for them to see from where they were on the other end of the, of the classroom. Uh, the group then decided to color the lights and add a green background. When that still didn't work in magnifying the visibility of the lights, the group decided to add two additional lights and therefore it forced them in their technical design to move from a simple to a parallel circuit, which is more difficult to build, uh, adding a more challenging technical element. Ms. J said that she would not have come up with this feedback herself. And during these role plays, Matteo, who struggled to find success in school and whom Ms. J has described to us as having a sad history, now he started role playing the master electrician and then he started wearing his uncle's electrician shirt in STEM class. He brought in electrical tape and he told stories of building circuits with his uncle from the age of three when he used to go on a job with his uncle as Matteo roamed around the classroom being the expert to help other groups build their circuits. These moments made increasingly present how systemic injustices operate through classroom regularities and that their maintenance and their disruption are necessarily collective endeavors reflecting all three rightful presence tenets. However, tensions also emerged as the class collectively engaged in political struggle and Ms. J began to understand her role differently. Ms. J started to consider what it meant to be an ally who has more power than her students by dint of her identity as a teacher and what it means for her in terms of actions, in terms of pedagogical moves, to engage in political struggle with students, reflecting tenets one and three. As she said to us, having the ethnography and survey and putting it in the spotlight, students' interests and everyday concerns, I was surprised. She said she knew that some kids did not pay attention to the classroom rules, and she said she knew that some kids carelessly walked in on others, but when faced with the evidence that it was very particular for boys of color who were suffering these kinds of botched in bullying, she said she was surprised. So this allied political struggle required Ms. J to recognize she wasn't the sole expert. She needed to learn with and from her students. And so as she began to, um, to engage in um, pedagogical practices that allowed students to freely roam around the room and to help each other, to hold up Mateo as the expert when he wore his uncle's electrician shirt, to bring in and center the community knowledge and expertise on what problems were worth solving, she began to um, engage in that, what we would talk about in both tenants one and three as at allied political struggle in ways where that responsibility is shared. And as she says here, um, in terms of her own learning, it was wonderful for kids too. I can say, I don't get this. Mateo, could you look at this? Sometimes you can find student experts. I think it's okay sometimes. It wasn't like it's a disaster that I could not always do this. I could say, who really gets this? Could you look at this for me and tell me what you think? This was a situation where I had to step back because some of them were better than me. 
Ms. J says she was uncomfortable and unsure of her own practice. The students designed and built the project that she herself could never have imagined. And further, by grounding engineering design in students' meaning-making of community data, Ms. J opened herself up to making present the political struggle of bathroom usage while diminishing the fear for oppressive um, repercussion. Students had the space to introduce this discourse, the discourse of bathroom bullying as legitimately welcomed epistemological dimension to engineering. These discourses became central to what it meant to learn and to be an expert in STEM, which we think reflects all three of the tenants together. So beyond the making of the projects themselves, as designs became irregularly used in the classroom, the projects themselves became these tangible symbols of youth's rightful presence. They became symbols of youth agency to make visible injustices and to promote social change. For example, uh, Ms. J described several occasions where students collectively called out, the lights are on as um, bargains occurred, increasing awareness of frequency among the people in the class, including herself, and by and to whom it happened. Months later, you heard this at the end of the video, according to the student creators, everyone could see how bargains related to bullying and that their designs reduced bargains. In fact, um, when word got out around the school that the occupied system had been designed and built, the group got contracted by other classrooms to put the system in their classrooms as well. So where does this leave us? SAU's stories today remind us equity-oriented teaching in science must seek to promote a rightful presence for all students, but especially among those who have been denied such presence through socio-historical and institutionalized practices of injustice. As creators of their own stories, capably representing themselves and others, the youth combine robust STEM expertise with the urgent hope to change things. However, for many youth without critical allies, gaining rightful presence in schooling and STEM is an uphill battle. But it is one that we must be willing to fight with youth if we are to push back against historicized inequalities and to enact new possibilities for a more just world. To support teachers in becoming critical allies, we share some teaching and learning tools that are available on the project website. And in particular, we offer some reflection questions that help teachers design, plan, and enact rightful presence teaching, as well as suggestions for how teachers might take up community ethnography as pedagogy in middle school teaching. So we know we've thrown a lot at you today, and we want to give the youth the final word as a call for all of us to listen and to learn from their efforts to engage in meaningful work in ways that hold possibilities for their lives in their classrooms right now, in their communities, and also in their futures. When asked what she thinks people would say to her engineering prototype, Jennifer, an 11-year-old Black girl who designed a solar-powered lighting, lighting system for a scooter for safer transportation, this is what she said. I feel like it will be super cool. People will love it. They'll say, who made this? It was me. Then they'll ask me, like, the tiny person always in the background did this? I'll say, yeah, I did that. This girl knows how to have fun, how to get down and smart when she really needs to. She could make the world a different place and help everybody else learn how to have the type of fun she has and stuff. Little kids can do ginormous work. Thank you. Thank you.